problems. Okay, uh, thanks, Andrea. So this is Johannes, and I'm Georg. Uh, and the subject of our talk uh, will be on the notion of structural properties and their role in philosophy of mathematics. This is the, the outline of our talk. So we say a little bit about on, on why the notion of structural properties is relevant, is important in philosophy of mathematics. And then secondly, we will uh, suggest or outline two, uh, two ways to explicate the notion, two formal explications of the notion. And interestingly, both explications uh, go back to or have roots in Rudolf Carnap's work uh, from the 1920s and early 30s. Uh, so this is the second point. And then finally, we uh, uh, say make some points of comparison com concerning these two notions. And specifically, we will show that the two explications are non-equivalent. That means they give, uh, determine different concepts or different notions of what structural properties of mathematical objects are. And we will uh, make some uh, uh, philosophical comments on, on this fact. OK. So structural properties playing uh, an important role in, in contemporary uh, philosophy of mathematics, specifically in, in uh, mathematical structuralism. So this is roughly the, the view that uh, uh, mathematical theories study only the abstract structure of, of, of systems, uh, or put it differently, it's the view that mathematics is not concerned with the, the intrinsic or internal nature of the object it studies, but rather with the, the uh, relations between these objects, that is, with the relational properties, how they relate to each other, right? So take the uh, uh, natural numbers as an example. Uh, according to structuralism, uh, theories of natural numbers, such as piano uh, arithmetic, do not uh, study these numbers as specific sets, but rather um, they, rather, they study uh, properties, uh, for instance, concerning how the, the numbers, uh, the natural numbers add up, how they can be divided, and, and so on. Here's a, a, a quote from a recent paper by uh, Austin Linebo, who, who nicely summarizes this view. So he says, uh, very roughly, structuralism is the view that pure mathematics is the investigation of abstract structure and all that matters to mathematics is purely structural properties of objects. Now, uh, what's, what's interesting is that despite their relevance in this uh, philosophical uh, research program, uh, very, very little has so far, uh, systematic uh, work has so far been done on how to characterize uh, these properties. So to best of our knowledge, there exists no systematic study so far. So what we will uh, try to do here is uh, outline two ways to explicate the notion, and we will call these two uh, explications the invariance account and the definability account. And before we uh, present them, there are a number of, of uh, remarks have to be made. So first, the first thing is that uh, we will do so in a traditional model theoretic framework. Uh, there are others possibly uh, more better, possibly more fruitful frameworks, such as category theory or uh, more recently homotopy type theory, but that's not our uh, concern here. Then another point is one central motivation of, of our work here is to see how the, each of the two explications uh, manages to capture uh, central intuitions about what structural properties of mathematics really are, how we should think of them. And one basic idea that we will assume throughout the talk is that properties, are, uh, properties of mathematical objects are structural uh, if they um, 
say something, express something about the, the, the structural composition or the structure of the objects considered, or if they say something about the uh, structure of the system to which an object belongs to. So, informally, we could say that structural properties are the properties grounded in structure, where uh, groundedness here is used strictly inf informally, but Johannes will give some hints how to make this, this notion precise in this context. Um, there is a standard example from, from Paul Seneff's Benazareth paper, which probably all of you know, so being prime, being a prime number is a structural property of the natural numbers, whereas being a certain set is not. Uh, having infinitely many prime numbers is uh, a structural proper, a property of natural number systems, whereas having the von Neumann ordinals as the numbers is not. Okay. Before we, before we uh, uh, present these two, or outline these two ways to explicate the notion, um, another point should be mentioned. We would like to give a, a, a kind of unified uh, uh, account on how to think about uh, structural properties. And uh, in order to do so, we have to disting distinguish between two types of two types of mathematical objects, or at least two ways of representing mathematical objects. So we call the first type structured objects, and have in mind uh, things like graphs, groups, vector spaces, and so on. And we distinguish those from unstructured objects, uh, and mean by this numbers, points, vertices, and so on. So structured objects in this, in this uh, sense are uh, conceived here as, as systems of a specific class of, of uh, specific <laughs> mathematical class or mathematical category. We call it type here. So the type of graphs, the type of groups, the groups uh, and so on. And these are usually defined by axioms formulated in a mathematical language. We have the definition of what we mean here, but we I'll just skip this. So systems are models. Uh, systems are conceived as models of this uh, mathematical language LT here. And once you've set up this uh, formal language for theory T, you can define what it means to be uh, uh, what, it, what an isomorphism between two systems uh, looks like. So this is for uh, the structured objects. And then uh, unstructured objects are simply objects that are uh, a part of the system of a given type T. So when we speak of structured objects, we will say systems in the following. And when we speak of unstructured objects, we will simply use the term objects. <coughs> OK, so now if you look at the, at the literature, especially in, in mathematical structuralism, you find two different uh, informal ways how to how this notion of structural properties is, is is characterized. The one is in terms of a notion of abstraction or invariance. So uh, here's again Linebo says that a structural property can now be characterized as a property that can be arrived through a process of structure expression, uh, I'm sorry, structure abstraction or equivalently a property that is shared by every system that instantiates the, the structure in question. This is the, this is one way to go here and the second way to go is via definability. So here you have a quote from uh, Shapiro. It says, define a property to be structural if it can be defined in terms of the relation of a given structure. So what we try to do now is give you two, uh, suggest two ways to make these two accounts uh, a bit more precise. And as I said, a starting point in both cases is, is, is kind of. So here is a, a passage, I think it's the first definition of, of what a structural property is. 
can be found in, in this manuscript by, written by Canop in 1928, around 1928. And he defines structural properties for, of relations, relations uh, is, uh, describable in, in a type theoretic. Uh, in a type theoretic setting. So he says, a property is a structural property in case it applies to a relation P, then it also applies to any other relation isomorphic to P. And he says, the structural properties are, so to speak, the invariants on the isomorphic transfer formation. They are of central importance for his axiomatic project. But that's a different uh, story. So, um, in order to slightly modernize this, this definition, uh, we have to do a couple of things. And the most important one is, uh, so in Carnap's case, Carnap's definition is in a way too general, because it speaks of any kind of relation. But what we want to do is, we want to relativize this definition to a particular class, so a particular type of mathematical objects. So what we say is, this is the Canapian based invariance, uh, uh, invariance account for structured objects. We say that a property is a structural property for the, the systems of type T if and only if uh, for all uh, objects in, in T, if there is system isomorphism between them, then uh, P holds of X if and only if it only holds of Y. So, the structural properties of systems of type T are precisely the properties invariant under isomorphisms in T. So this is the explication for the first, first kind of object. Then there is a, a, a symmetric or similar uh, definition for uh, unstructured object, objects. And this basically uh, assumes the same framework, so we say uh, let S be a system of this particular type, so a graph, a group, whatever, and then we say a property of objects in the domain of S is a structural property if and only for all other systems of that type of, of, of uh, mathematical type and for all possible isomorphisms between S and S prime, uh, the property is preserved under the the, the isomorphisms in question. So if P holds of an object X in the domain of S, it also uh, holds of the, the image of X given by uh, any isomorphism. So structural prop informally structural properties of objects in the system S are the properties uh, that objects keep when making isomorphic copies of S. So this account uh, agrees with many of the, the informal intuitions that we, we have about uh, structural properties. So um, here are some examples. Having infinite many, infinitely many prime numbers is a structural properties of uh, systems of pia first order piano arithmetic. And prime being prime is a structural properties of numbers of such systems. And having the von Neumann ordinals as the domain is not a structural property of piano arithmetic systems, and being a specific set is not a structural property of numbers in those systems. And what's I think what's important here is to point out two two uh, two, two things in addition. So um, the, uh, the 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 explication this based explication gives us uh, a partial definition or a relativized definition. It's relativized to uh, a specific type T of mathematical objects. And then it's, and the second point is that it's not a re it's a non-reductive definition. Uh, so the account presupposes uh, a, a specification of isomorphism for the objects considered. And this in turn presupposes a prior specification or selection of a theoretical language or, uh, if you will, a, a, a set of proto-structural terminology that can be used to define this notion of isomorphism. Okay. Okay, this is where I take over.
And um, what I, I want to do quickly um, uh, give a sort of philosophical interpretation of this account. Um, I mean, what we're trying to do is get get a, a, a firmer philosophical grip of uh, structural properties. So we want we would we were wondering um, how f how far or in what way does this invariance account capture the intuition that structural properties are properties grounded in structure, so that properties that thing has in virtue of its own structure or structure of a system that it belongs to. And uh, we want to do so, like provide an answer to that question um, in terms of a uh, Lewisian theory of about this. So Lewis, um, in this paper from 1988, um, statements partly about observation, um, gives a definition of what about this is one of the sort of standard definitions um, in, the, in the literature. There's a, it's a simplistic definition, but we're going to work with it for now. So the idea is that a, a statement is about a subject matter if and only if the truth value of the statement um, is invariant under the subject matter in the sense that the truth value of the statement is the same in any two possible worlds that are indistinguishable with respect to the subject matter. So to get it, to, to look at an easy example, um, this well, for, forget about the formula. To look at an easy example, statement the ball is blue, talking about a specific ball, is about the color of the ball. Because if you take any two worlds that are indistinguishable with respect to the color of the ball, the statement the ball is blue will have to have the same truth value. Whereas the statement the ball is blue is not about the material of the ball, because you can find two way, uh, worlds where the ball is made of the same material, but it has a different color. Okay, simple theory, I think it's fairly intuitive if you adopt a possible world um, framework. Um, now, we want to apply this to, to mathematics. Um, and if you do so, you see that it doesn't really work, um, at, at least not in the way that, that Lewis envisioned it. But, well, the, the thing is that usually you would say that mathematical statements in such a framework are non-contingent in the sense that they're either necessary or impossible, um, and therefore, according to Lewis, about any subject matter whatsoever. But, I mean, the spirit of the, um, of the account uh, can be preserved and applied to mathematics as well if we, uh, well, we restrict ourselves now to mathematical statements and we just take the possible worlds to be models, um, which is the natural way of doing this in our context. And then we get a definition for, uh, of aboutness for um, mathematical statements. And what we say is that, so we fix such a language like we had before, standard model theoretic language, and we say that the subject matters are the petitions of the models. Um, of, uh, of that language. And then a statement phi <coughs> is about such a subject matter, about such a petition, if and only if uh, all models that are indistinguishable with respect to that uh, subject matter, so that are in the same petition class, um, uh, uh, satisfy the statement. Uh, so are equivalent with respect to satisfaction of the statement. Uh, really, not satisfy the statement. So if one satisfies it, the other doesn't. So, um, they either both or neither does satisfy the same. Okay, so um, we look at this now, well, we take this as our definition and then we, we look at an example to see what this, what this does, right? So we take again, standard example arithmetic, so language of piano arithmetic, but now we extend the language and we, we throw in a, 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 a membership predicate. Um, so then we get an extended language, a plus of PA, uh, and there we can say something like 2 plus 2 equals 4, and we can say something like uh, uh, 2 is a member of 4. And then we define a subject matter for this language, which is the structure of the natural numbers. So we said subject matters are partitions of the models, so we say it's the partition of the models that um, uh, partitions the models into uh, <coughs> equivalence classes according to whether or not they're isomorphic as um, if you look at them as models of the original language that you started with. Um, so any two models in which the, the, that restricted to the, to the language of PA are um, isomorphic, then um, they're in the same equivalence class. And um, we think it's the, the natural way to view the subject matter in the setting, um, the subject matter of the, the, the structure of the natural numbers. Um, and then we can just observe that gives us very intuitive results, we can say 2 plus 2 equals 4 is about the structure of the natural numbers, whereas 2 and 4 is not about the structure of the natural numbers. And if we, we, can, we can actually sharpen this a bit more, we can see that um, if we say that a formula expresses a property if and only if it defines its extension, then we get a nice little theorem 
that a closed formula um, in this extended language defines um, um, uh, a structural property of PA systems uh, if and only if it's about the structure of the natural numbers. And we want to say that, well, that's sort of the intuition of the invariance account that um, the structural properties according to the invariance account are the ones that are about the structure of the things that they're supposed to be structural properties of. Okay, and now I hand it back to Gail for the... Okay, so much for the, the first account. Now the, the second second way to, to uh, explicate this, this notion. And as in the first case, there is a Canabian uh, background here as well. So this time the, the quote we present is, is not from this Untersuchungen uh, manuscript, but from, from the Logische Aufbau. And here he gives a, an informal characterization of what uh, he takes, he, uh, how he characterizes formal properties of relations. So he uses the term formal properties here. And he says, by formal properties of a relation, we mean those that can be formulated without reference to the meaning of the relation and the type of objects between which it holds. These are, the formal properties can be defined exclusively with the aid of logistic symbols that is uh, ultimately with the aid of, a, of the few fundamental symbols which form the basic uh, of, of symbolic logic. And what one has to add here uh, uh, is, as in the, the previous case, the symbolic logic that he uh, mm -hmm. assumes here is uh, quite uh, powerful uh, logic. It's a, it's a simple uh, theory of, of, of types. So, and one thing uh, one should note here is that uh, Canop speaks of formal properties here, but what he means, he takes this notion to be synonymous with uh, what we call structural properties in the, in the in the previous manuscript. So he has less two ways how to how to, to think of these properties, and again our uh, idea is to to make this a little bit more precise or give a, a modernized uh, account of this. Um, Again, for both type of uh, uh, both type of uh, mathematical objects, so the definability account for structured objects first. We say that a property is the structural properties of systems of a particular mathematical type, if and only if there exists a closed formula in that language, such that the uh, extension of that property is identical with the set of systems of T that satisfy that, uh, uh, that formula, that, that closed formula. So we say that uh, the structural properties of the T's are precisely those properties whose extension is definable in, in this uh, language LT. And again, uh, analogously, we can uh, define uh, uh, or specify this definability account for unstructured objects that is objects occurring in systems, such as numbers in and number systems. And we say that S is a, a particular system of type T and a property of uh, uh, objects in that domain, in the domain of S, is structural uh, if and only uh, if there is an, an open formula in LT such that uh, this formula phi uh, defines the, the, the extension of P. So as in the above case, we say the structural properties of objects in S, in system S, are properties whose extension uh, uh, are definable in, in LT. Okay, and as in the above case, uh, this account agrees with uh, uh, our intuitions what structural properties of mathematical objects are. So you have the same examples that we already uh, mentioned before. And also, as in the above case, the, 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 the account given here is partial and, and non-reductive. And the account is also sensitive uh, how we uh, represent objects and, and systems. But here, an important point has to be added, it's, it's not only sensitive or relative to our prior cho choice of, uh, of, of uh, 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 mathematical terminology uh, or signature of a theory, but also depends 
very strongly on, on the logical strength of the, of the background uh, language that we are using. And um, okay, now I try to finish the rest of the talk, uh, acknowledging the constraints of the finiteness of the Yes, yes, uh, sorry. Um, now I try to finish this in, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, okay, we also have a philosophic interpretation of this definability account. Um, it's a, bit, a little bit less straightforward, but we think it also gives a, a, a reasonable idea of in, in what sense this definability account captures the intuition that uh, 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 structural properties are properties grounded in structure. Um, and we're going to do this in terms of uh, truth making. Um, so we define truth maker models in this, with the same way that Van Frasen, for example, does. This is now a bit more on vogue, as you can find. It's reason we've been taking an interest. Um, a truth maker model. Um, consists of a domain and a set of facts and verifying the falsifying relations uh, between facts and, uh, uh, and sentences um, such that no sentence is both verified and falsified. Um, uh, negation is verified by something which falsifies uh, the negated thing and the other way around, uh, um, a negation is falsified by something which verifies the negated thing. And you have similar clauses for the other um, things, so like a, a disjunction is uh, verified by something which verifies at least one of the disjuncts, um, and falsified by something which falsifies both of the disjuncts. Um, I'm not going to go into the quantifiers. Actually, you can see here we're assuming is that we're working in, in a full language where you have constants naming everything. It can be sort of justified in standard ways, but I mean, I don't, I don't want to go into the, the details that much. If you, if you have any, any questions later, we can, we can talk about them. Um, so this is a, uh, a truth maker model of facts and uh, things and uh, truth making and false making. And we have a notion of satisfaction in the truth maker model for um, formulas. So the truth maker model T makes a formula phi true. Uh, sorry, it satisfies its formula phi if and only if there's something among the facts which makes it true. Um, and uh, well, that so far so good. We're going to use this now for, um, for, for the framework that we've been setting up. Um, and to do so, we first define a sort of auxiliary notion. We define for every model M, um, now in the model theoretic sense, uh, an associated truth maker model. It has the same domain as the model. And uh, we're going to define the facts and the verifying and falsifying relation uh, in the following way. So the facts are the subsets of the atomic diagram of the model. Um, so uh, both atomic statements and negative atomic statements with uh, um, all those which are true in the model, right? The model, standard model theoretic notion. And um, verifying and falsifying is then defined by simultaneous recursion, um, where we say, we, we, we only define it here for the, for the literals, right? Um, so a literal uh, P is made true by a fact, so a subset of the atomic diagram, uh, if, the, if, the, if the atomic set, set is in there. Um, and the negation is made true if, it's, if the negation is in there. And it's falsified if it's not in there um, by that thing, OK? And uh, we then add the other cl clauses from the definition of a, um, of a truth micro model to get a, a full recursive definition um, for all formulas of this relation. And then we can see that a formula um, holds in the original model if and only if, it's, uh, if it holds in the associated truth micro model. And well, we, with why do we do this maneuver? Um, we think that I mean there's a reasonable interpretation of the of the truth maker associated truth maker model of telling us via the verifying and falsifying relation, which facts in the sense of true propositions ground or make true the, the, the formulas which are true in the model, right? It gives us sort of the reasons for why the formula is true. And um, well, now back to structural properties. The idea is now that we go back to this language, like extended piano arithmetic with a membership predicate. And uh, then we, we can show, as a, like, and again, a nice little lemma, that if we take all the formulas in this extended language, um, which, uh, sorry, if we take all the verifiers of formulas in the original language and the falsifiers, and we throw them together, we get an atomic diagram of, um, a mo of, of a model of the original language. So that's a, a lot to take in, maybe, but uh, we think that it provides a reasonable idea of in, in, in which sense um, the, the things that which are definable in the associate language, even in an extended language, are the ones that, if they're true, they hold, in, um, they're made true by the structure of the thing that we're trying to talk about. Okay, that was maybe a bit quick, but if there are questions, we can talk about it in a second.
Um, that concludes our um, interpretation of the definability account and now um, the promise comparison. So an easy observation is that the definability account now subsumes the invariance <coughs> account just by a standard model theoretic lemma, the isomorphism lemma, that whatever, um, uh, whatever uh, uh, statement you take, it's, uh, it, it holds uh, in isomorphic, uh, isomorphic, it's invariant under isomorphic models, right? Uh, whether or not it's satisfied. It's very easy to show. I mean, that's what the notion of isomorphism is there for. But, I mean, this entails that definable properties are also invariant under isomorphism. So whatever, um, whatever property is uh, structural according to the one approach is going to be, to the definability approach, is going to be structural according to the invariance approach. But of course, the other direction doesn't hold, which you might also have guessed already. So in, in general, it doesn't hold. And now, actually, it matters what, we've been sort of silent on what the languages are, right? First order, second order. And now we can be more specific. So if we, um, if we, uh, um, it's one on fact that, that first order piano arithmetic can't categorically axiomatize uh, um, the standard model. Um, so we have something which um, is invariant under isomorphism, a property, namely being isomorphic to that model, but that's not definable. So there's something which is uh, structural according to one account, but not according to the other. So you might think that's because of the first order thing, but actually, well, as you also might have guessed, in the second order case, it's no better. You can find certain structures. So I'm not going to go into the details now because I'm running very low on time. Um, uh, but you can find you can find sort of the same kind of example where um, sort of trivial examples from well-known facts that 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 show that um, you find also invariant properties that are not defined in the second order. You can go even up, but uh, and at some point they're going to meet up if you go to infinitary languages. Um, but the point is that uh, there's 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 a kind of mismatch between the two accounts, and it, it strongly depends on the kind of logic you, you use for the languages in the background. So we, because I'm, I'm running now because we have also some philosophical equivalence with the two accounts, despite their mismatch, namely that if you take now we also been silent on what the properties are, right? If you take a fine-grained view of the properties where you individuate by how you express them, sort of, then we find a lot of properties that are invariant for the wrong reasons. So the property of being such that there's a non-isomorphic system is going to be invariant with the isomorphism, but we think at least there's a strong intuition um, uh, contrary to it being uh, structural. Um, another one is like, I don't know, being such that Socrates is wise, sort of propositional property, which is uh, trivially invariant because it's either true or false, um, and then it's going to be shared by all the things. So um, again, clearly not structural, we think. Um, okay, and for the um, for the other account, uh, um, well, to sort of summarize, if you take such a view, the um, <coughs> invariance account overgenerates, right? And the, depending on the strength of the language, um, some intuitively structural properties are not structural. This is the first order case of. Uh, piano arithmetic being isomorphic to the standard model intuitively just as a structural property of models of the first, for, even first order piano arithmetic, right? Um, so, in this sense, uh, uh, for, for limitations of the logic uh, given by the logic in the background, the um, uh, definability accounts under generates. And then we, we just want to sort of sum this up. I mean, there's something which you, um, which you could have seen already if you if you're very familiar with, uh, if you, no, actually, if you're not very familiar, if you just have heard of the logicality debate, uh, like we did today, um, uh, then you see that there's a, a, a very close analogy between the definitions that we gave of, uh, of structural properties and the, the definitions that have been proposed in this logicality debate. And now, this is something that we want to work on in the future, that we want to, we want to look at, like, what's the, what's the real difference between structural and logical properties? Is there a difference? There's, a, there's some, some idea that this might actually connect to the logicism debate um, from a structuralist perspective. So it's stuff we want to we work on. And now maybe the thing that we skipped in the, in, in the beginning, like we, we said that we're not going to talk about um, uh, uh, this homotopy type theory, univalent foundations project. Actually, now given what, I've said, what we've said so far, we can, we can sort of look at the univalent foundations project from a, from a new perspective and see that they're sort of solving the mismatch by moving to a totally different sort of language. Uh, uh, Martin Löw uh, intentional dependent type theory, um, where if you add the right axioms, definability is actually the same as an uh, invariance. So 
there's a sense in which the homotopy type theory is like a really structuralist um, theory. Um, also something we would like to explore, so like look at the same kind of things from, from that perspective. Steve's paper, um, Steve Audi, from that, which was published, published earlier this year, is actually going in that direction pretty explicitly, um, but we want to go into more detail. Uh, and then finally, we might ask the question, is there a correct explication? You might just say no. Uh, it depends on the context, it depends on the language you choose, and you choose the language according to your pragmatic needs. So, um, three possible ways of, of looking at this, which, with which we're going to close, and thank you for bearing with us for so long, and uh, we acknowledge the foundation, uh, well, the Google Foundation, for supporting us generously, and say thanks. Yes. Uh, very interesting talk. Just a quick question. So it is quite common in mathematics to consider uh, kind of properties that are not uh, invariant under all possible isomorphism, but just under sub relevant subclass of isomorphism. Uh, how do they fit in your picture? And um, if you consider some of them. I guess the I guess the answer would be like this is a uh, this is a point for uh, for a structuralist right if, if this is the case and if the correct uh, explication of structural property is the ones that are invariant under isomorphism then it's just false that mathematics on, mathematicians only care about um, uh, structural properties but uh, uh, might be a point like you could also turn it around and just say well this means that it's the wrong explication, and then you have to look uh, for more detail. I mean, we're, we're sort of just approaching the field and just giving the most straightforward explication, and then would be actually an interesting case to, to look at. Um, thank you. Robert? Uh, just quickly, I mean, so the definability approach, I mean, one might think that the degree to which the notion of definability is very malleable, dependent on the resources, yeah. you know, incredibly troubling. I mean. I mean, you know, if you allow parameters, for instance, you can get really trivial definability. Exactly. You know, and in fact, in your semantics you were giving for the truth maybe was you took arbitrary parameters from the domain. I mean, if you yeah. do that, everything's definable, right? Being, you know, you get hexagons and things. Being this. Is, yeah. Is, is so, yeah. <coughs> so, yeah. Yeah. It looks like um, you have in the definability account, you have a a non ad hoc component why a property structure this this is the, the, the choice of your uh, mathematical signature right. and then you have a, a strong ad hoc component yeah, and that's exactly. just a lot logical strength that you so I mean that might be I mean another point in favor of I mean there, there's something with the, with the with the uh, definability approach that you would like to have some some kind of like standard way of talking about the things and this is another Thing pointing towards univalent foundations, where you might have like a language which actually doesn't have these problems, right? Where you uh, uh, you have a standard language which 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 does the things you want, but uh, maybe it's lost the sound. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have two questions, please, mate. Samantha. Um, I don't know anything about homotopy type theory, but um, you said that according to that, definability equals invariance. Mm -hmm. So does that mean there's no over generation or under generation of structural properties in that case? Uh, yeah, I, that would be that would be the idea at least. I mean, th this is now like I mean th th this is some. Uh, all of this has to be made precise, right? And it really depends very much on uh, how you understand these notions. But I mean, this is uh, sort of a part. Of, um, so there's this univalence uh, uh, axiom which which states that. Um, Identity between the types that they talk about is equivalent to um, equivalence, uh, which is supposed to be isomorphism, right? So, um, and 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 this axiom, they, they have models for these for this theory with this axiom, and they sort of they, they validate this, but it's 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 very non-standard from a, from a classical perspective. So it's 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 very hard to say this like this is why this was sort of pointing to its future work. But the idea would be like it's really structuralist in the sense that you the models you get for this theory they, they actually talk about like types of groups where you, you, you can identify the ones that are isomorphic um, in a sense. Yeah. So um, would the idea be then that the like given a, a good 
and like a systematic um, version of structuralism where you get the right number of structural properties out. I mean, is that hostage to just what axioms we choose? Well, it's like, so, it, this is sort of the way of doing foundations, right? You, you, you mm -hmm. find the right axioms to do mathematics, so it yeah. influences it both ways, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We run out of time, but if it's very quick, Gianluigi. And I actually, I mean, my question was actually asked by uh, that person over there, namely, uh, if you, if you um, um, don't specify uh, rigorously what you mean by definable, then you you run the risk to tr trivialize um, your position. On the other hand, there is the opposite um, question. Namely, um, is it intuitively clear why uh, any structural property has got to be definable in a good sense of so? Yeah, uh, I guess, I mean, very true. And we've been sort of uh, glossing over the details in many, in many things, right? So uh, a, a part of our approach was that, um, I mean, you look at these things as models, and you have a language which you, you then actually specify specify fully, and then uh, I don't know. First order piano arithmetic systems are different from second order piano arithmetic systems, and you actually, and then you can talk about like identity of these um, of the structures or the uh, of, of those things, and it, it gets it gets very messy. And uh, um, it's it's yeah, it's something which we which we've been sort of willfully ignoring, and. Uh, um, I'm not sure. I mean, there, there's the intuition that uh, uh, of, of, of some people that structure should first be definable. I mean, in the end, it's what mathematicians talk about. But maybe that's the point. Um, I mean, that it gets sort of trivial is, is another point against the, this, this idea. Um, so, not entirely sure. Um. Okay. Thank you very much.